Good morning. I'm Kelly Schultz, and I'm the CEO of the Maryland Technology Council, and I want to welcome everybody for joining us this morning. Um, hopefully you have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea um, to be able to sit back and enjoy and learn a little bit about the world of quantum. We have some global experts that are here with us today that I'm excited to introduce. Um, but just a little bit about us at the Maryland Tech Council. Um, happy that you've joined. We are a, a wonderful association that works with biohealth, life sciences, and technology in general. And we've been focusing the last several months on quantum because it seems to be um, a very big up and coming emerging technology that can introduce new ways of doing business for just about everybody. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about that today. I wanna to thank uh, those uh, that are from the Maryland Tech Council that are here that helped to set this up. But I do wanna turn it over because um, there's limited, limited time and I know you have limited space in your world. Uh, I wanna be able to make sure that all of our guests have an opportunity to introduce themselves. And I'm gonna start first with um, our friend Trevor Shellu. Um, so that he can introduce himself, his company, and a little bit about what they're doing. Trevor, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you, Kelly. It's it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Trevor Shalou. I'm on the product and marketing team uh, at IonQ. Uh, a little bit about IonQ. We are a, a Maryland-based company that was founded in 2015, and we focus on uh, building the uh, hardware to power uh, quantum computation. And so we uh, we are two founders. Uh, one of them came out of the University of Maryland. He was running a, a lab there doing quantum research. Uh, and we started in a small space uh, just off the, the campus uh, at the University of Maryland. Um, and since then, we've been focused on uh, the research and development behind building uh, universal gate quantum computers. So think of the, the actual hardware that will be doing the, the, con the quantum computation. Uh, we have uh, several systems that are currently commercially available, uh, and we have an aggressive roadmap to continue to develop those systems to uh, uh, increase the, the utility of what these these systems can provide and hope to fulfill a, a lot of the big claims and promises that people have in their minds uh, around what quantum can do. Um, we also focus on uh, supporting customers through uh, application support. Uh, so the software layer, building the actual programs that uh, will run and, and ex be executed on the, the quantum, compu uh, quantum computers. Uh, and so together, uh, those are the services that we, we provide and the, the company that we have uh, built uh, here in Maryland. Thank you, Trevor. I appreciate that. And I can't wait to hear more. Thank you for being a Maryland based business and starting up the way that you guys started up. I remember listening to you guys a long time ago um, when we started the quantum conversation. Uh, next, we have Dennis Mandich. Dennis, welcome. Thank you for coming and sharing your expertise with us this morning. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, my name is Dennis Mandich. I'm the CTO and co founder of Crypt. We're a quantum secure and post quantum encryption systems company that guarantee the security of your data and infrastructure against attacks by quantum computers and other network infrastructure problems that you might encounter over the years. I'm a physicist by background. I spent 20 years in the intelligence community where we worked on highly secure systems that had to communicate all over the world, embassies and other infrastructure that we had. And we wanted to bring that same technology to commercial industry, make it a lot cheaper and more accessible to the community. So we partnered with several national labs, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, Los Alamos National Lab, and several universities around the country and in Europe in NATO countries to build these systems and make them easily accessible through the cloud. Great. Thank you, Dennis, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Mark Jackson, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm Mark Jackson, and I'm the senior quantum evangelist at Quantinuum. Um, for most of my life, I was actually an academic physicist. Um, I did something called string theory, which uh, Dennis and I actually share. Um, but then about six years ago, I was hired by a small British startup called Cambridge Quantum Computing. And we grew very rapidly. Um, at Cambridge Quantum, we did quantum software, but we then um, merged with Honeywell Quantum Solutions, uh, which, which Honeywell spun out, to form a new company called Quantinuum. And so we're, we're a very large company now with 500 employees having both hardware and software. On the hardware side, we have an ion trap machine, which, uh, which has the highest confirmed quantum volume. And then on the software side, we have all the applications, including chemistry and machine learning and cybersecurity. 
And we've also developed an open source uh, um, software development kit called Ticket, which allows you to most efficiently run your quantum software on any machine, ours or anyone else's. Wow, that's exciting. Um, I'm surrounded by physicists today. I'm feeling a little bit outnumbered. But uh, <laughs> next up is uh, Prachi Vakaria. Yeah, well, I'm a mathematician, so you have some balance there. Okay, uh, good. Name... Thanks, Prachi, for holding out on us. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Prachi Vakaria. I live just south of uh, Maryland in Washington, D.C. Uh, currently, I work with a company called Amazon. Uh, Amazon, of course, has its own quantum initiatives, but I'm here not to talk about Amazon, but actually something else I started, uh, a few of us started from MIT in back in 2017, and it's a foundation called Womenium, where Womenium was inspired by, and I was inspired by all the amazing women in DC, leading uh, groups like NIST, DARPA, ARPA, National Science Foundation, and I wondered to myself, how do we make more scientific leaders, and how do we make female scientific leaders? And this is where the uh, women was born. And we typically work with US government agencies, many of the agencies I just mentioned, the NIH, uh, et cetera, to train people in the cutting edge of technologies that are 5, 10, 15 years away. And this is truly the hallmark of a leader, right? So last year, we partnered with NIST, and we partnered with actually Dr. Malu Slot, who's one of the uh, scientists focusing on quantum materials at NIST. And with her, we created the now, which is the largest quantum training program in the country. Um, our first program, we trained over 1,200 people from 88 countries in quantum technologies, quantum software, lab tours, and the entrepreneurship angle, which is dear to my heart as well. Uh, this year, we will again train people. So this will be a second workforce training program. And our goal is again to double the numbers from last year, uh, expose people to all the different kinds of quantum computing. So all the different types of quantum computers and how we develop them. And of course, understand software, understand applications, and really work with companies to build the software, um, uh, build the software applications and build the quantum applications of tomorrow. So that's a little bit of our, our goal and mission. Thank you for having me. Well, you are such a leading expert. And so we're very happy to have you on here, Prachi, from the very beginning. So uh, we're going to start some, you know, just questions about, you know, who, what, where, and when, right? About the whole quantum scenario. Um, and I had my first introduction to the world of quantum several years ago when I was at the Department of Commerce. And I was introduced from a uh, by a good friend of mine, Julie Lenzer, who many of you may know from the University of Maryland, who has left the state of Maryland, but we're going to still claim her as our own, to a book that she got for her child and herself to learn about quantum. It's basically a children's book for those that want to learn about quantum. So that's where I'm coming from today, the, the amount of intelligence that I have about this world. So I'm very intrigued to just kind of pick at that to, to see where we're going with this industry, with these technologies. So I'm gonna start um, the first round of questions and Dennis, um, I'm gonna call on you first. So in your opinion for what you are working with in the, the quantum universe, why should a company consider deploying quantum now? So I'm in the quantum secure systems space, not quantum computing, which the other folks on the call do. When I was at the agency, we saw the largest scale of IP uh, and other data theft from, you know, General Alexander said it best that the NSA is the single largest transfer of wealth in history from one country to another. And we really wanted to put a stop to that. And although harvest now and decrypt later is the buzzword in this space today where big nation states and hacking groups are collecting information that they can exploit in the future, either with quantum computers or finding flaws in the software libraries that were used to in, in ensure the uh, security of those systems. So the systems that we build today make all of that go away. The internet really evolved from using it to communicate among people to being an exploitation uh, model for big social media companies where they collect that data for free. Uh, they made it very easy to do that and to violate our privacy, what we're doing is making end-to-end -end encryption systems that are secure, not just against the internet itself, but also all of these networks that are under adversarial control. And every company has been suffering from ransomware, cybersecurity attacks, uh, theft of their IP. And really in the quantum age, all of these systems become transparent to quantum computers. 
and we make the tools available to very easily implement on your network infrastructure to make all that go away. Make any two endpoints, uh, Alice and Bob, we usually call them in cryptography, anywhere in the world, whether they're in Australia, China, the US, Europe, uh, make those two endpoints secure and not worry about the infrastructure in between that quantum computers can now break into. So transitioning now is almost like self-preservation and we're going away from this you know, surveillance economy where a handful of big companies have exploited that data back to privacy. And we're already seeing that in GDPR and other regulation around the country, including in the US. Well, thank you for that. And I, I think that the, the security aspect of it is extremely important. And you know, coming from your work in the federal space, how important that is in the intelligence space. Mark, I think similarly, um, how do you make the business case for businesses to go into the quantum world at this point? Sure. There is sometimes this misunderstanding that quantum is decades away. And, and I can kind of understand why that is, because because it's been talked about for, for a few decades. But the truth is, is that the field has made so much progress in the past 10 years that we believe that we're actually only two to four years away from having commercial applications. So we can do things today which are interesting, um, maybe not commercially valuable to a company, but we think in a few years that will change. And, and two to four years is really no time at all, because even if somehow magically tomorrow we had a super powerful quantum computer, it would take a few years to write the software. And so this is why we're encouraging companies to start investing in quantum now, and they don't have to spend millions of dollars if they just get to know what quantum is and start like a small pilot project and start working with quantum companies, they can at least understand what's happening and how it will be relevant to, to their um, their field um, in the near future. That's why we're here today, Mark. Absolutely. Yeah, to tell them why. Prachi, why, why should a company start? I mean, you've been in this business for a long time. So tell us the why for a business case. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of industries are going to be impacted with quantum computing, and we are estimating the value of that positive impact to be over a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars by 2030, 2040. Those industries are par primarily the finance industry, uh, anything that touches materials, so the chemical industry, life sciences, pharmaceuticals, uh, and then uh, the travel and logistics industry itself. Uh, there have been a lot of cases, so I, my background is in transportation. At Amazon, I focus as a transportation innovation specialist as well. Uh, I've seen BMW go to a lot of um, quantum partners in this ecosystem and ask that question, you know, how should we be quantum ready? And everything from optimizing the production of our vehicles to coming up with new metals to put in their cars, all of that, they're exploring how quantum can be used. Um, D-Wave has an interesting case study where the port of uh, Los Angeles went to them and said, you know, how will quantum really impact us? And especially ports, and this is the largest port of the country, they have very, very complex operations. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of different unique use cases, but just a simple use case where we were, they were able to show a quantum advantage was they were able to show a 60% increase in deliveries per crane per day uh, because of how, uh, we were able to model and use those cranes in a more effective way using quantum computing and simulating what a quantum computer can do for them. Uh, so I think companies are starting to explore how can we get a quantum advantage and starting to kick off with pilots. And in fact, even Vermilion has been approached because we have access to a global pool of talent. We've launched something called the Quantum Solutions Lab where companies now come to us and say, you know, I'm a car maker in Sweden. What can I do to optimize how will quantum computing optimize and help us do CFD, computational fluid dynamics differently? We also have a US uh, national lab that's come to us and says, well, can we use this to start exploring what it means for our energy related materials? So really my advice for companies looking to get started is twofold, right? Start with, if, if you work better with reports and trying to do a theoretical case, start there. If you work better with small case studies, mini applications, really start there and try to show to your leadership that there's a real advantage in having quantum and exploring what it means for your company. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. So that's gonna roll us into our next question, Trevor. And I'm looking for some examples of some real use cases for quantum, right, Trevor? So if, if somebody's on here watching, watching us talk today they're like why us why now and how is this going to help us are there any of those types of use scenarios 
Yes, um, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about that. And, and I'll also say, Kelly, I have that book uh, that you're referencing. Uh, INQ sent it to me when I had my third baby uh, last year. Um, so we're getting him started early. Uh, but I'm not a physicist or a mathematician. And so uh, those types of explanations are, are, in fact, useful. And I think it's good to kind of start there when we think about potential applications and, and use cases. Um, and I'll, I'll build off something, you know, Dennis talked about, you know, his, his entire company is providing solutions for the, uh, the quantum age around security. And, you know, why is that such an important topic? Some of us who are, you know, if, if you're less familiar with, with quantum itself and its capabilities, uh, you might be wondering why is quantum so different from classical when it comes to security, right? Like we've, uh, we've got these encryption solutions that we've been using on the internet for so long. Uh, why, why do those suddenly not work with quantum, right? There's a conception sometimes that uh, quantum is a more powerful form of computing. It's, it's kind of continuing the, the growth of computation that we've, we've experienced over the last several decades. Um, it's actually not that kind of continued growth. It's a fundamentally different way uh, of doing computation. Uh, and so the things that we thought were solved uh, with classical computation uh, or potentially unsolved uh, are, are not true in the quantum space necessarily, right? And the encryption, uh, to go back to that example, that's, an ex that, that's a place where we're seeing a solved problem when it comes to classical computation that now becomes unsolved when you start adding a, a quantum dynamic to it, right? And so that's why companies are, are starting to prepare uh, for this next phase. And that same type of going from, from, from unsolved to solved or vice versa can apply to lots of other places outside of just security uh, as well. Uh, and so uh, at, at INQ, we think of kind of the, the broad buckets of opportunity uh, within quantum uh, are within optimization. So some of the examples that, that Prachi was just mentioning with the port, that's an optimization problem. Uh, we also see simulation uh, uh, challenges that quantum offers uh, big advantages in. So uh, the, the world around us uh, at the lowest levels behaves uh, from the laws of quantum, quantum physics. And those properties and that behavior is very challenging to simulate with classical computation, with any degree of accuracy, uh, especially as those simulations start to become more complex, which is where the real value is in, in, in material design and chemistry. Uh, and so uh, quantum, because of how we're doing the computation and the fact that it's using the same properties that govern the world around us, quantum computers are actually uh, very promising when it comes to that type of, of application. Um, and then the last place that we think of quantum being applied is through uh, machine learning, right? Which, you know, at risk at the risk of like throwing around that that kind of buzzword of, of, of ML, but there are very promising uses of uh, quantum uh, in uh, machine learning, uh, oftentimes augmenting what's happening with some of the larger models that are still being taking place on, on classical com computation. Uh, and so at INQ, we have examples across kind of all three of those buckets of where companies are beginning to apply quantum research and quantum techniques to those three types of challenges. Uh, and, and in some cases, we're seeing kind of the glimmer of, of places where uh, quantum is actually uh, outperforming. Um, but in many cases, uh, companies are investing to start to develop that expertise, to start to, to uh, develop the teams within the organization who have familiarity with this type of work, because it is such a fundamental shift. And so it's still in that kind of research uh, phase where uh, companies are exploring the problems that they feel uh, are uh, unsolvable today using classical methods uh, and exploring are there ways to potentially start to solve those in the near future uh, by applying uh, different techniques in quantum. Kelly, if I, if I may add to what Trevor said. Yeah, Trevor's absolutely right in terms of simulations, optimizations, there are different kind of like you call them categories of, of problems that, that quantum computers can really solve. However, one area, you know, with all this focus on computers, you really forgotten our quantum sensors. So while quantum computing gets all the money, all the hype, there's also quantum networking, there's quantum communications, and an area that Wimpenium is looking at and exploring are quantum sensors, which are more near-term applications. So when you think of where do I act now, I do want to let the audience know quantum sensors are not the way in which you could start exploring what is that quantum advantage because look ultimately the quantum state itself is very fragile it's very sensitive which is really bad for a computer so it's it's bad for for mark and, and trevor's business but it's actually good for uh for a sensing business because they're highly sensitive uh so now we are seeing a few different groups across uh ukic south korea 
uh, China, and of course the US here, where we're seeing different kinds of quantum sensors emerge. Um, one type I can I can let this audience know is a magnetometer, which uh, which is now getting used to, of course, detect like small magnetic uh, activities. So they're called NMRs, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, and they used to track uh, basically a better version of fMRI machine. And this is something that the healthcare and biotech industry, which is big in, in Maryland, is looking at. In fact, NIST has a project here as well. Another one are gravimeters. And this is to again detect uh, sensitivity sensitivity in in um, um, in, in gravity detections and uh, changes in gravity. And this is where I'm seeing the oil and gas sector. Uh, we are in fact uh, involved with a, a project and exploring a project with CCUS carbon capture utilization and storage and using these gravity meters. Um, you know, also they can be used. Different kinds of quantum sensors can be used for detection uh, detection of gases. And what I've seen happen is companies like BAE Systems. They just have um, three quantum aperture projects, in fact, $6.5 million in, in uh, a contract there. Uh, NASA has been doing a lot of work in the space as well, especially like I mentioned for remote sensing, climate monitoring. And I've seen again, oil and gas sector invest about 14 million pounds, this is in the UK doing this. So again, a lot of local activity as well as international activity in the space and a lot of really interesting applications that companies are exploring. So I want to put that on the map for our audience as well. Quantum computers are awesome. If you're looking to get started sooner, do explore quantum sensors as well. Great, thank you, Prachi. I appreciate that additional information. Dennis, are you seeing any um, industry specific uh, types of usage where the applications are in your world with your company more um, deployable immediately or that they're looking at it into the future? Yeah, for large enterprise, it's it's really not for small and medium sized businesses yet, although it works perfectly for them in the financial industry, telecoms and of course, government. These are the biggest adopters. They have infrastructure all around the world. They have a presence in lots of countries that have to transit networks that go through China, Russia, North Korea and so on. And these need to be secure at the endpoints. You can't trust the infrastructure in the middle anymore. And a lot of what's happening in the quantum computing space is really driving this transition into what we do. The last time the world went through this kind of a transition cryptographically was over 20 years ago. And we're a little bit more than halfway done with that. And that was when the internet was very tiny. I remember all of the internet, all of our digital networks run on just two algorithms. And those algorithms are the ones that are broken by the kinds of quantum computers that folks are building today. It will take at least a decade to transition all of these systems from the current classical encryption that we use to the ones that are secure against quantum computers, which is why the US government has really driven this. There's two national security memorandums, eight and 10, multiple executive orders, legislation, uh, and more coming down the pike. And the US government has told us that you must transition. This is non-negotiable. If you want to do business with the federal government, which is a Fortune Zero company, they're bigger than Walmart, then you will do this or you will be replaced. So that's where we're seeing it. It's all the companies doing business at this scale that really need to do it and they need to get started now because it's going to take 10 or 15 years to get there. That is so interesting. You know, I think, you know, those of us of a certain age, you know, you just start thinking that you're getting used to the internet of things, right? And so so now we have a, a comfortableness with being on Zoom and being able to share data and you know, not having to go to the library to look in the encyclopedias, although that's still fun. Um, but, but what does that mean, Mark, as far as the expediency? Because now we're talking about government entities. I mean, they have a usage for it um, in their space. And what does that look like as far as the the, the space and the deployability of something like that with the Fortune Zero type of, of entity? Uh, so Dennis is completely right, of course. Um, there's been a lot of concern about the effect that quantum will have on uh, on cybersecurity. And he was, the previous comments are correct in that things that we we have taken for granted that the integrity of, of RSA and AES type encryption. Um, I think a lot of, so I think many people are aware of these headlines of the threat of, of uh, of quantum computing. What I think people are less aware of is that quantum can be used to protect communication. And so that's the basis for a lot of 
this discussion that that these quantum technologies um, can be used to do this. So, for example, we at Continuum we've produced a way of of producing provably secure keys for encryption, because we don't know what will happen with with post quantum encryption and all the different algorithms and things. Um, but one thing that every type of encryption needs is secure keys, the numbers that are used to perform the encryption or decryption. And you can actually use quantum physics and quantum computing to produce these keys. Um, so you don't need to trust that that um, that they're secure. You can actually prove it. And so um, so I think all of these things that we've been using for encryption um, and cybersecurity the past few decades will be upgraded in a major way. And I'm, I'm um, very glad to see that the US government has, has taken a lead, as Dennis mentioned. Um, there's uh, this contest being conducted right now by NIST, this US government agency, looking at the different types of post-quantum encryption. And so it's this elimination round. And um, so hopefully we should see a few winners in that in the next few years. That's that's very interesting. And, you know, so going back on, you know, what we're going, how we're going to transition to this new technology, and it's going to be, as some of you say, mandatory in the future for us to have this. I'm going to talk about how we shift ourselves internally then, because companies have an existing workforce. Um, they have existing skills that are there. Um, Trevor, I'm going to ask you, because you're not a physicist, and neither am I, like, how do you, number one, how do you attract people into this workforce, but how do you kind of change the internal aspects of those requirements that are needed to work in the world of quantum? And I want to, I, I want to hear from all of you because you're kind of working in such different spaces and obviously I'm a workforce junkie. So um, how can we do that? And what's the best steps to take in your opinion? Yeah. You know, I, I think this this question uh, is one I think we can look back into the past of, of other times we've seen big uh, disruptive technologies uh, come out and and the, the type of workforce and expertise and internal organizations that a company would need to be prepared. It varies at the stage of development of that adoption and of that industry. So we are early um, in the quantum uh, 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 transition right now. And um, what that means is that the companies that are taking advantage that, you know, the, like the, the customers that INQ has who are actively using our quantum computers for research and for use cases, um, they are getting in incredibly early on this technology. And what that means is that the levels of abstraction that are, are have been have been built over decades in classical, they're just not here in quantum. And so the folks that are taking the, the best advantage um, typically have uh, experts, they have physicists, they have folks who understand uh, how these computers are actually working, uh, because that level of, of uh, knowledge is useful at this stage um, in, the, in, in quantum. Um, they have uh, algorithm developers who have um, experience in quantum as well and, and understand how quantum information science uh, works and how it's different from, from classical. Um, and that's reflective of just kind of where we are today. And so if you're looking to be uh, a very early adopter, if you're looking to move into this market uh, in the next year or two, having that type of expertise on staff is going to be very, very useful. Now, of course, you can, uh, you don't need a massive team at this stage. There are plenty of companies out there, INQ, Continuum, others that uh, will help you on that journey, right? We we have expertise, we have the experts, we, we offer the consultative services to help you bridge that gap. Um, however, it is still useful to have uh, some level of expertise in the organization at this stage of development. Now, we hope, and, and I'm sure others in the industry hope that that is not the way that quantum will be used uh, into the future. Uh, we the the layers of the quantum stack will continue to develop. The places where companies can plug in and start to take advantage of quantum will move higher and higher level uh, so that you don't necessarily need to have that low level physics understanding just to make use uh, of a quantum computer. Um, that will happen in the next few years. And, you know, as, as Mark alluded to, there is often a misconception that, you know, this will be a, in a decade from now, right? We think it'll be much sooner um, than that, uh, but it's it's still useful for companies who do want to be an early mover uh, to, uh, to have that expertise on the ground level now. Uh, and then as their use of quantum scales, ideally the need for that type of profile within the company um, will begin to, to lessen. 
Prachi, how does Amazon feel about that, about building a workforce in a large organization? I would yeah. say it's a pretty large organization. I would say for any organization, join the Women in Quantum program. Uh, it's every year in July, we host a program. We attract a wide variety of, of people from a wide variety of backgrounds. So engineers, computer scientists, physicists, mathematicians, in fact, even biotechnologists who come and join Continuum uh, in, in, our, in our program. So Women in Quantum program really started because there was a seminal paper that was released about two to three years ago, um, which really said that uh, quantum needs a wide variety of backgrounds. And it's not a whole master's or whole PhD that's needed to enter the field. It's really a little bit of training that can get people to understand the fundamentals and help them switch careers. So this is exactly how we shape the Women in Quantum program, which is seven, typically, you know, five to seven weeks long. We focus on training people on the different types of quantum computers, actually take them inside the labs, which otherwise no one, I mean, how many of us have seen the inside of a quantum lab? Very, very few, but we want to change that and take get people to see what does it mean to have, um, you know, what does a photonic computer look like? And, and what does a superconducting computer look like? So really get into what that means. Then focus on applications. How do you program on quantum computers? Um, we have over 40 companies that participated in last year's career fair because every company is recruiting right now to Trevor's point. We all need talent. We need good talent. And um, even at actually one of my fellows at Berkeley, she had her classes canceled because there were just not enough students. So I don't think institutional education is there yet. And this is where women feel fills a very nice gap, again, of giving that concrete fundamental education and exposing people to the wide variety of applications. So we've had, um, you know, IonQ and, and Continuum and about 50 other companies be a part of our program. And at the end, we do end with a career fair. Uh, but of course, um, what I encourage people, you know, it's great to join a company and, and do good work there. I also have a, a passion for entrepreneurship. Um, so we do have a fund now uh, that will invest in our cohorts that come from our from the Women in Program as well and invest in their companies as well. So last year we had three startups that grew out of our program. Uh, so that's a little bit of the of our vision and how we're trying to close the gap to really take people who are existing engineers, PhDs, postdocs, and get them into the quantum field. That's great. So. Um... There's, there's time, Mark, right? So I just, first of all, I just want to state there's a couple of people that are asking questions. Um, in about 10 minutes, we're going to take the questions um, that are in the queue. So if anybody has a question to um, ask any of our panelists or all of them, please put that in there and we'll spend some time at the end to be able to do that. But, but Mark, how are you building a pipeline? Are you building a pipeline? What is the skill, if you were going to talk to an 18-year-old kid graduating from high school, what's a skill that they would need to go to be where you are today? So I do talk to 18-year-olds, uh, many of them. Um, part of A big part of my role as quantum evangelist at Continuum is talking with young people who are interested in this. And I, every morning I wake up to a uh, a number of notes on LinkedIn from young people who are very enthusiastic about the quantum space and want to know how to get into it. And that's that's wonderful because there are so many job opportunities um, in quantum now. Um, it used to be purely academic. And, and so it's great that we have this commercial sector. Um, I should say that we at Continuum, we have internships. That's a very important part of what we do. And we actually do participate in Womenium. We participated last year. We will participate this year. We found it to be a great experience. In fact, we recently hosted a hackathon in Trieste, Italy, and uh, one of the participants from Womenium actually joined us in person at the hackathon. And so we found things like this to be a great source of outreach. Um, a lot of what I do is visit academic groups. Um, I, I, last year, I spoke to about 40 academic groups um, in person or on Zoom about quantum computing and the career opportunities, because I think a lot of times in academia, it's sort of in, insular, and they don't realize there's this whole world of of things that they could be doing, and it's very exciting. And so, um, so yeah, just activities like this are very important for for developing this talent pipeline. Yeah, getting the word out that there is new career space out there, right? So, and by the way, I love quantum evangelist. I I think that that's the best title ever. Th th thank you. It, it, um, most of the reception. I get is very positive. Um, in Greek, evangelist means bringer of the good news. 
And, um, and so it, in the 90s, it kind of became popularized in the tech community. Um, Apple Computer started it. And so, um, so that's where it comes from. Very cool. Well, I think you make a perfect evangelist. Dennis, so the world has changed since you've been in the intelligence world, right? So you have a completely different background, maybe, than some folks that are coming into this new industry. Do you see it changing even from the space that you're in and the skills that might be required in the type of area that you're working with? I think from my dark background, people realize more of what's going on in the world today, the, the scale of the hacking, the, the theft, and that transfer of wealth that I talked about before. So although people uh, maybe 10 years ago didn't think about their personal security and what happened to their personal mm -hmm. data, they think about it a lot more now. And when they look at applications that they're using and what the companies are doing with that data, they're concerning maybe I won't use this application because it's not made by Apple it's made by you know maybe Zoom that might be data mining mm -hmm. my information and it's not just intelligence agencies anymore it's big hacking groups and so on and going back to an earlier point you know with quantum computers the they solve problems that can never be solved by classical computers it ultimately separates the haves and the have-nots in the future the people that have quantum computers that can leverage oh. them for certain classes of problems will win in that market space. And the false analogy that I hear a lot is with fusion energy. There's zero market reason for fusion energy. It's it's a solved problem that burning that black stuff from under the ground, we got that for another hundred years. We can make electricity already. With quantum computers, you can solve problems, including in my industry, breaking encryption that couldn't be done otherwise. If you look back at the history of all these technologies, you know, nuclear technology was used to blow up cities before it was used to you know, cure cancer. So I look at it from that perspective, from the global arms race that we're in, in quantum, which is coming. We're in a competition with China on many things. Quantum is one of the biggest ones that's at highest level. And so for the workforce that we need in this country, we need to have that kind of a program that they have in countries like China here to develop that community. They don't all have to be physicists and mathematicians. There's lots of things that you can do in the space. You know, the, the programming work that the quantum computer companies are doing is, is absolutely critical to make them easy to use. Yeah, so that's really interesting. And you have just, everyone on the panel has just such a different perspective and a different background and how to move forward with it. So I'm really excited to hear that. I am going to ask one last question that I have for you, and it's just a little bit of a technical question. Um, and then we're going to move into some of the audience questions. So if any of you, and you can just speak up and let us know, because there's a difference and you've all talked about software and hardware and quantum and all of that. So can somebody explain or all of you explain the difference between quantum hardware and software? Don't all jump in at once. We make both. Uh, you do both. So tell what what it, how does that look? So similar to what Mark does with generating the keys for encryption systems, there's no way for a computer, which is a precise mathematical computational device, to generate a random number. You need quantum entropy sources to do that. The government's been doing that for decades. It's very expensive. It's on a light table or it's radioactive. We partner with the national labs to build that. But then to actually make that stuff work, make it available through the cloud, make it secure for download, that's a whole software team that has to do that. So there's people that do embedded engineering, hardware design engineering on the quantum side, and then all the systems that make that usable for a large enterprise. I can add a few more words to that. So quantum hardware is you're building the actual computer that performs the calculations. Um, in, in the quantum context, this is based on qubits or quantum bits. And there's different technologies to build qubits. There's ion chop technology, which is what continuum and ion Q and a few others use. There's superconducting technology, which Google and IBM and Rigetti and a few others use and so forth. Um, quantum software are instructions to manipulate these qubits in a clever way such that the solution, whatever problem you're trying to solve emerges from these qubits. Um, and so you you use tricks from quantum physics to put the qubits in superposition or entanglement um, such that the correct answer to your problem emerges. And so that's um, that's the difference between hardware and software. Yeah, and, and 
to, to tie it briefly back to the previous question around kind of workforce and, and development and where are the opportunities to get into uh, to quantum, uh, one of the things that we often work with our customers on is that to, to program a quantum computer, to write the software that will be executed on a quantum computer, um, it's different. Uh, it's software, just like we have software today uh, that we use to run this meeting and, and do everything else we do on our computers. Um, it's it's software. There's a commonality in that sense, but it's different because you're encoding information into a quantum system, not into a binary bit. Uh, and so uh, there's the, the hardware. If you go to our website, Continuum's website, you know you see the picture of the you know the big boxes. Um, you know inside of that there are little ions trapped in space, uh, and the ions are where the the math is being done for the, the, the quantum computation. Um, and uh, then there's the software layer. Uh, and that's, an, that's a very interesting space. Both of them are gonna evolve uh, uh, continuously. The, the computers are gonna become more powerful and more advanced. Uh, and there are gonna be more and more layers of software um, that are interchangeable uh, that that can run on on those computers and and one of the things that I uh, is is actively trying to do is we we want our we want our systems to be um, as interoperable and accessible to as many of those software layers as possible. So there's um, SDKs out there, the software development kits like uh, the one that that uh, Continuum has in Ticket. There's there's many others in Kiskit and Circ. All of those layers um, of software we want to be able to to work on our systems uh, because there will be this uh, this this emergent space where there's more and more software uh, being created. Uh, and it's it's important that that software is is interoperable on on uh, the hardware as well for this uh, industry and this system to continue to develop. Okay, so I'm just going to roll into these questions that are coming in real fast because it's on everybody's mind because we've been talking for it seems like the last year, two years about this insurgence of AI and how that's really going to start impacting our world. So we're going to have to unpack this a little bit because everybody is now just trying to figure out chat GPT, right? So how does the AI experience interact with quantum? Uh, Prachi, I'm going to ask you first. Um, there's a lot of questions on how those two technologies, I would say, are interacting and if there is an interaction. Yeah, Trevor mentioned this before. So you can use quantum computers to, to run your AI ML models. That's absolutely possible. I think my question would be, do you want to do that? So at the end of the day, quantum mm -hmm. computers are not going to replace classical computers. There's still a strong value for classical computing. There's still a strong value for high-performance computing. And, uh, and quantum computing would be another kind of computing which is needed for, um, yeah, for certain circumstances when you have lots of data or data that takes a lot of time to compute and, and just different kinds of data. I think the encryption part is a, is a good case as well. So I think quantum computing has applications it can do really well. And I guess the question would be, uh, do you want to run your AI ML models on quantum? And A, does that make sense? What is the value you're gonna get out of it? I think that's how I would I would ask any um, uh, person today, what is the value? And what is it that you can't do with, with classical that quantum really adds value for? And and I would add to that, you know, the the I think that's a fair evaluation for kind of the current state today, right? The things we're seeing classical uh, AI models do today are mind blowing, right? Like the Chat GPT, as you mentioned, it's incredible the capability. A lot of folks didn't realize that that's where the the state of the industry uh, was. I think the the difference is that you know open AI, open AI came out and recently said that they can't continue to build the next generation of those models the way that they've built the current ones, and that's because uh, classical computation uh, scale has been relatively cheap for a long time. And so the way that this industry has developed is by throwing more compute resource um, at these models. And when you look at the, the, the kind of most advanced uh, networks out there, the neural networks out there, they're using enormous amounts of classical computation. Um, there are energy loads associated with that that start to become unsustainable. Uh, you know, literally just just powering the computers that are big enough to run these models starts to become prohibitive, uh, and uh, that's not even taking into account uh, the the scale of the systems physically that are that are required as well. 
Um, and I think that's where people are excited about quantum when it comes to this space uh, as well. Uh, the, the quantum computational space scales much more efficiently, both from a, a, an energy consumption standpoint, as well as from a uh, you know, physical computational resource standpoint. Uh, and so uh, that's where there, there are things that are very exciting. You know, com classical computation can still outperform quantum when it comes to AI. Um, today, uh, but the the place where we're seeing parity, you know, we have a a, a really interesting use case with Hyundai, who's doing uh, machine learning around image recognition for uh, self driving cars. Um, we have demonstrated that we can match classical performance on very small scale experiments uh, of classifying images. But the way that we can match classical is with significantly fewer parameters. Uh, we can converge on answers much faster, uh, and we can use less computational resource compared to the classical uh, equivalents. And so that's where the promise really lies, is that as, as quantum continues to scale, uh, it'll be able to solve and build the next generation of AI models in a way that classical will eventually plateau just because throwing more uh, classical resource um, at these problems um, isn't going to be sustainable for, for kind of the next generation. It's interesting, Dennis. I, I I'm curious um, because you have a lot of history in the um, in in the world and trying to analyze, you know, where we're heading in the future. And and I don't think a few, well, maybe ten years ago, we didn't anticipate that AI could lead to some of the, I would say, ethical questions that we have today about what's happening and the usage and what we all know the the topics of conversation there. Do you think that there's a way to foresee anything within quantum that could have a similar type of impact? Absolutely. The combination of quantum computing with classical MI and machine learning, it, it will have profound effects on cryptanalysis, mm -hmm. looking for problems in all the cybersecurity tools that we use today. All, all these things have been broken classically. Uh, from simple things like, you know, we found out that the random numbers that are generated for our keys aren't actually random, and machines are really good at finding those patterns, and then just predicting uh, exactly what keys you're using to encrypt all of your data. And more of that will happen with all the tools, the, the solar winds uh, attack, the flaws in those systems, the flaws in the data that are fed into these AI models, it's called AI poisoning, all these things will be exploited. Uh, within the community. We can't count on these things only being used for good. I feel like I'm the dark cloud over some of this conversation. We're having all these positive things that Mark and, and Trevor and uh, Fachi are promoting, but I see it from the other perspective that this will always be used uh, by bad actors, the big nation states that don't play by the same rules that we play by. And I, I really feel that we, we need to move very quickly on this or we'll end up the second uh, economic power in the world, not the first anymore. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And so we, if we talk about, you know, a geopolitical type of conversation and bring that in here, you know, there is always a race to the top, right? So um, I, I really appreciate your perspective on all of that. And I think that considering some of the questions that we're having um, from from our audience, it's it's very relevant and on people's minds and uh, being able to work all of that together. And um, I think we've, you know, technology has been around since man, right? Since we created the wheel. And I think that by learning from the past experiences and how to handle the different types of technologies that come forth is, uh, it's an important lesson. So thank you for being that part of the conversation. We, we appreciate that. Um, I want to ask. Um, there's there's a couple of very specific. Um, if we move, it, Mark, did you have anything on the AI issue? I just wanted to make sure. I don't think I have anything to add that hasn't been said already. Um, people ask me about this, and uh, it's not just possible that AI and quantum will collide. It's inevitable. Uh, quantum will absolutely be a part of AI because AI is based on machine learning, which is looking for patterns, and classical machine learning um, misses a lot of patterns, whereas quantum is much more sophisticated mathematically and would pick up on it. And so um, so we will absolutely see a convergence of quantum and AI in the not too distant future. Thank you very much for that, Mark. And I'm going to go through for some rapid fire questions here. Whoever wants to answer, you know, first at the at the mic gets the answer. Uh, Quentin um, has asked, what kind of quantum computer is the most promising in your eyes? If you ask the two of us, Tre Trevor and myself, <laughs> I, I think we would say ion trap technology. I can that. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and there, and there's there's a good reason for that. The, the truth, um, more more neutrally, the truth is that there are several promising technologies, each of which has advantages and disadvantages. There's a reason that many different technologies are being explored. And the truth is that the, there will probably be several winners, um, depending on the type of problem that you're doing. And so um, so IonTrap is is up is very promising. Superconducting is very promising. Photonic is promising. There's there's a few others which are being less uh, commercially explored yet. Um, but the truth is that um, that there's there's no obvious winner. But fortunately, we have several. Yes, and to add to Mark's point, I completely agree. There are different approaches, and if you want to understand the difference in the approaches why different teams are exploring different ones and how they really work. Yeah, I'll make another plug just to join for the lab tour day of Womenium. You know, it's a free program. Really, everyone's welcome. Uh, but just come for those lab tours because I think that will give you a very good idea of how we're approaching quantum computing. Anybody else on that one? Okay. Um, quantum internet. Joe Reddix wants to know if there's the future in quantum internet. I'll jump in and I mean, quantum internet's going to connect a lot of these quantum computers. I don't, I won't comment on that, but, uh, for quantum security, uh, these quantum tools will be used to build a quantum secure internet, which is, you know, very different from a quantum internet, which just moves around qubits the way that a classical internet moves around bits. So with that, I guess a, a similar question, cause you mentioned that, um, Anthony Lawrence asks, if we can connect the quantum computers so that they can work together to solve problems, are they interconnectable? They they will be. Yeah, that absolutely will be one of the, the features. That's awesome. So Prachi, I just want to talk, um, going back a little bit, somebody had, you know, given you kudos as to um, your work with um, your programs, uh, your workforce programs. Um, and the womanium, 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 I'm going to have a hard time saying that, Prachi. So you're going to have to, um, anybody that wants to sign up, anybody that wants to send anyone to these programs, you had mentioned a couple of times that they can do that. So that's very exciting to get people involved. Um, I see, you know, lots of um, uh, just, diversity on, here. Prachi, yeah, can you talk a little house? bit about the diversity with that and what that looks like? Oh, with the workforce training. Yeah, and, and quickly on Womenium. So if you want to join for the summers, which is our second year's program, womenium.org forward slash quantum. And Womenium really comes, uh, this is again a history lesson uh, after after what Mark said. But no, if you think of plutonium, titanium, we, we've named our elements, you know, ending with an EM. So women EM, the element of women, which is what we are, we are going for. <laughs> oh, got it. Yeah. yeah. I, see, um, now I'm in the know. Now I'm in the know. I feel good about that. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I, there's, there's so many programs out there that are looking to be able to attract people in, in diverse demographics and areas to, to get them involved and, and specifically um, females in STEM occupations in general. And, you know, we continue to work on that as, you know, overall in, in all of our worlds. Um, but um, one question from Justin that just came in, how do you feel quantum will impact the cryptocurrency blockchain industries, which is also another hot topic, both politically and within the society? So what do you think about that? I, I can comment on that because that's a question I get a lot. You know, the uh, original blockchain that was built with Bitcoin uh, that's the most vulnerable because a lot of the original wallets use this older type of cryptography that can easily and quickly be broken by large enough quantum computers. The quantum secure cryptocurrencies and blockchains uh, are all second after Bitcoin. So if the first quantum computers are used to steal all that Bitcoin from those really big, you know, hundred billion dollar wallets, these are not, it's not hyperbole, there's hundreds of billions of dollars worth in those wallets then the, in my opinion, the price of all of them goes to absolute zero. They're, they will be worthless mm -hmm. because there's no trust in the system anymore. There's no insurance to get that cryptocurrency back. That transaction is immutable. I'd like to add one thing. Um, besides the cybersecurity part of it, I'm often asked, could you use a quantum computer to mine Bitcoin? And the answer is no. There was a study done on exactly this, mm -hmm. this topic. And the answer is no. Um, GPUs are actually more efficient than quantum. And so that's that's the fortunate answer is that they can't do that. 
Interesting. So there's been lots of studies done and there's been lots of technology that's been developed. Um, I'll just go into this before we kind of um, let you guys say some fine words if you have anything that's left unsaid. IP. So what does the world of intellectual property look like right now in each, I'm going to ask each of you, um, your worlds um, in the quantum space, um, what does that look like for the future? I think it's critical. We, we spend a lot of time on our IP, uh, making sure that we cover only what we actually do and not try to become patent trolls. There are a number of people out there right now, which I think is a problem with patent law. Uh, they're just, they, they don't actually build or do anything. They just try to cover spaces in quantum so that we would have to pay licensing and so on to them. My rant against that industry. You know, I love the honesty. I'll give a slightly different answer, uh, you know, because obviously as a quantum manufacturer, uh, there, there are uh, huge priorities on developing IP around the technology that we think is most beneficial. Um, but one of the places we encourage our customers to think about why move now, uh, why start to think about quantum now is that uh, we, we've seen this with other disruptive technologies, the companies that develop the IP uh, in this case around how to run the applications to extract value from quantum computers. The companies who develop that IP uh, ahead of the technology uh, are the ones who can capture all the value um, when that technology becomes uh, at a larger scale. Uh, and we've seen this time and time before. And so one of the places that we encourage customers to think about is when they're doing research, even if the quantum computer uh, is not able to outperform classical today, um, if they're developing IP in the quantum space around how to leverage that quantum computer to solve their challenges, um, that becomes incredibly valuable uh, as the uh, industry continues to mature. And so locking up that IP and developing it uh, as a use case for using quantum today is, is a big opportunity. For our hardware and for the quantum applications, we're of course very protective of, of the secret sauce in each of these things. And so um, there's certainly that. But for the ticket software development kit that we developed to efficiently run quantum software on any machine, we have the opposite viewpoint. We actually made it open source about two years ago. So we actually made this completely available and free without any licensing restrictions um, for anyone to use and contribute and edit however they wish to use it. Um, because we want to, to push the entire field forward and we want everyone to contribute um, and, and have their code benefit. Prachi? Yeah, and I will add, so we don't <coughs> develop any IP, we focus on workforce development. I will do a shout out for Unitary Fund and efforts like, like these guys that are trying to have IP and uh, yeah, work in the, you know, create basically digital commons and in this case, quantum commons. So there's, there's certainly a role these organizations have to play as well. That's great. So one, my last question for you guys. You um, are all experts in this field and you all have a lot to share. Um, just wanna make sure that you're comfortable if any of our viewers have not been able to get their questions answered that they can reach out to you personally and we'll send them your contact information so that they have that. Um, and I just wanna open it up. If there's one final word in this lightning round within the next one or two minutes, Trevor, go. What is the most important for pe thing for people to know about right now? Just engage. Just get engaged uh, in the industry. Learn. Uh, explore. This, it's the time to do it. Yeah, come to the Women in Program. Really understand the fundamentals. I think that's important. And then next, let's get started is, is my point. Like I said, with many applications, pilots, even a paper of outlining and thinking through how does quantum impact me? What I've seen in the industry is they tend to put one or two quantum experts in their company. Actually, they don't know much about quantum and they really don't have the resources, power of funding to, to do something in quantum as well. So really take, I would encourage companies to really start exploring what, what the impact can be beyond just putting these placeholders um, within your company. The commercial quantum advantage is much sooner than most people outside the area think. Um, and so I, so, as, uh, as Trevor and Prachi mentioned, I would uh, strongly encourage companies to engage with quantum companies such as Continuum and understand how it's going to affect them and start on a project right away. I'll add a final note that your personal privacy and the economic viability of your company, your country, will all depend on quantum in the very near future. It's coming way faster than you think, and it'll take a really long time 
to get to a quantum secure state. So you should start now. Well, so everybody, you have heard it from these wonderful folks that have, you know, really um, given us their valuable time today to talk about this. I have a funny feeling that we're going to be back for a follow-up webinar because there's so many questions and a lot of information. And if our guests um, agree with that, then we can invite them back and we can, you know, talk about some very specific topics that have come up on questions. We will share um, all of the um, contact information with the experts here today and feel free to follow up with them, follow up with us at um, at the Maryland Tech Council. And I've been really happy to be here with everybody this morning. And thank you all. Have a wonderful, productive Thursday. And we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.